Welcome to Sports Pause. As we turn the calendar and turn back the clocks, some teams are looking to stay strong in conference play, while others try to turn over a new leaf. Coming up, the women's cross country team ran for glory this week in the MAC, cha MAC championship meet. How'd they do? We'll let you know. And field hockey fights Monmouth for the MAC regular season title and home field advantage for the conference playoffs. Plus, our own Hannah Cotter sat down with James Ford Jr. for a basketball season preview. And Victoria Ritigliano sits down with volleyball middle, middle hitter Allison Lee in this week's Meet the Bobcats. That and more coming up on Sports Pause. Welcome to another edition of Sports Pause. I'm John Franklin and that's Gabby Riggi. And Gabby, the fall season is the fall postseason sports are starting to take form. The women's cross country team came away as MAC champions on Saturday for the first time in team history dethroning perennial powerhouse Iona. Niam Ash, Tracy Campbell, and Emily Wolf were all top five finishers for the Bobcats. Also coming away with the hard care was coach Carolyn Martin, who was named MAC Cross Country Coach of the Year. Up next for the Bobcats is the NCAA Northeast Regional, hosted by Boston College on Friday, November 13th. This week, the men's cross country team took to Pennington, New Jersey for the MAC Championship. The Bobcats placed 7th out of 11 teams, and senior Matt Mencher earned all MAC honors for his performance. Mencher placed 15th out of 169 runners. Quinnipiac sophomore Drew Rada placed just behind Mencher, finishing 16th overall in the best performance of the sophomore's career. Now let's send it to Shane Dennehy, who's with women's cross-country coach Carolyn Martin. Shane? So... Caroline, Caroline, uh, so this is, congrats on the MAC title. Thank you. And obviously your fourth career uh, coach of the year, the first in the MAC. Um, so how does it feel like knock off um, Iona after they won 10 straight MAC conference, conference titles in a row? It, it was really exciting. Uh, I, I didn't know if we could do it. Uh, I was pretty sure looking at all the stats coming up to it that the women had a great shot going into it. but. Um, I really didn't know. You know, we had a couple of girls that were a little banged up from the season, and we weren't going in 100%. And we just sort of, you know, made them believe that they would have a chance. And they went in, and they ran their hearts out, and it was awesome to watch. Um, so, like, do you, like, train your runners to be peaking at championship time in the season? Like, are, they tr are you trying to build them up so they're performing at their peak in the best they can when it comes to the MAC championship and hopefully regionals and maybe even nationals? Yeah, um, pretty much every year we try to peak all of our athletes to perform at their best at the, at, the, at the conference championship and then really at the regional championships we're looking to place as high as we ever have. Um, so every year we kind of look to tailor their performances and we, you'll notice we hold kids out of performances here and there um, and some, you know, we'll, we'll lose some early meets. Uh, because we're kind of trying to save them for when it's most important during the championship season. All right. So, like, what does the future hold? Obviously, you're losing Tracy Campbell to, Tracy Campbell to graduation this year, and she was a big leader for the team. Uh, she was huge this year uh, and last year. She's done a great job for our program. She's a captain. She's a leader. Um, the girls really look up to her. Uh, it's going to be a big loss. I do think we have a very young team, though, um, still. And, uh, you know, looking at some of the other teams in our conference, we're going to be a really strong force for the next few years. So uh, if I can get a great freshman class to sign this year, then I think we'll, we'll be in good shape for next year, too. Uh, so, like, what are your expectations for regionals? And, like, do you think you have a chance to maybe even possibly go to the nationals? Uh, right now, we actually walked off the field uh, at the MAC Championships with um, some possible injuries that we may not be able to have some of our athletes performing at the regional championships. Uh, it's my hope that we can put the, the same top seven that we ran at the MAC into the Northeast Conference Regional, and we can get a top ten finish. That's, that's the goal. Um, it, it, you know, it depends on who we're able to come out. I have one girl with an ankle injury and um, another athlete with a foot injury, so that may not be possible. Um, so can you like just like talk about like what you're going to be doing for training like leading up to the national I mean regionals that are in two weeks so like if it's going to be like a light week this week maybe heavy week or going to like mix in between the both the two of those. Uh, so we dropped down their mileage quite a bit um, for this week and or for the week leading up to the MAC and this upcoming week we'll pop their mileage up a little bit more. Uh, we still are two weeks out before the regional championships. Uh, the week of the regionals will drop their mileage way down so their legs feel really fresh and they're ready to race. Um, 
we don't, pretty much everything's in the bank by now, so we don't have to go too crazy these next two weeks. They really, it's more recovery, more rest, um, and sharpening, just doing some workouts where we're sharpening them up and some shorter intervals to get their legs feeling good and ready to race. All right, thank you, Coach. Uh, back to you guys on the desk. All right, we're going to hop over to field hockey right now. Fairfield, uh, field hockey hosting number four, Fairfield on Sunday. Five minutes into the first half for Fairfield. Julie Depew comes on in, gets around one of the defenders, and scores. It's her first goal of the season. It's now 1-0 Fairfield. Now prior to this next play, Fairfield scored to make it 2-0. Michelle Federico streaking down the side. Dana Barlow in close. Shot scores. Cuts the lead in half. Now 2-1 for Fairfield. 17 minutes in the first half now. Megan McCullough drives on in with a little short chip shot. Unassisted goal. Fourth of the season. It's now tied 2-2. Two to two. End of the first half now, or start of the second half, end of the first half, pardon me, Dana Barlow streaks in with the opportunity to get the last shot just wide. We'll end the half at two. Start of the second half, Julie Depew sends it on in with a shot from Ann Burgoyne, shoots and scores. It's now four to two, Fairfield. Middle of the second now, Quinnipiac putting on a little bit of pressure. Felicia Constanzano, excuse me, scores unassisted. It's now four to three, Fairfield. Still in the second half now, some pressure. Megan Cullough with a diving save in the corner. Stands on her head, still 4-3 to three Fairfield. Now, final minutes of play. Megan McCullough with a penalty corner. Shot score from Angie King. Quinnipiac ties it four. We're going to overtime. Here, Dana Barlow streaking in through the middle of the uh, field with a shot. Rister scores 5-4. to four. Quinnipiac wins the game. We're going to come from behind victory. Gives them their share of the MAC title. Let's hear what Becca Main had to say. Obviously, a few more teams have to play in the MAC, uh, so we'll see who we're playing on Friday. And um, it's just a lot of film preparation. Obviously, we're um, going to the tournament. We have the MAC banquet, so it's a lot of the exciting stuff that we have. We do a lot of team traditions uh, that we've done for a long time uh, going into the MAC. So it's an exciting week because we put in all the hard work since preseason in August, so it's good to you know, finally get to the exciting part, not that any other part of the season wasn't exciting, but this is the part that we look for. I think what it says is pretty much what we've consistently been doing. We've been in every game this year. We've had 20 games. We've been in every one. Um, and being able to come from behind, which we've done numerous times, it shows a lot of character. Um, it shows balance. Our team is quite balanced in terms of who's giving what each day. I mean, I, I guess recently you'd have to say Dana Barlow has really stepped up her game, and she's been steady all, all season. But for us, there's a balance, and when you have that balance, you don't look at the end of a game like this for some one certain person to have the ball. So I think it's really nice that they can put the ball in anyone's stick and, and we have that confidence to win, win a MAC championship regular season title. So it's obviously very exciting and it's rewarding. I think the most, most important thing is there's a rewarding feeling that what you've done has got you to this point and you've trusted it and now you're a MAC uh, regular season champion. Now let's take a look at the standings with the top four teams making the playoffs. Number one, Monmouth takes on number four, Fairfield. And number two, Quinnipiac plays number three, Ryder, in a rematch of the 2013 Conference Championship. It's also a rematch of the Bobcats season finale, which the Bobcats won in overtime, five to four. The semifinals are November 6th, and the finals are November 8th at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Women's soccer played in-conference opponent Siena on Tuesday in a win-and-you're-in situation. The Bobcats came into the game tied with the Saints for the final spot in the, MAC in the MAC tournament. It was quite a first half for both teams with Siena dominating the possession early. Siena's Madison Vasquez buried the first goal of the game on an assist from Michelle Yaniello with just 10 minutes remaining in the half. Entering the second half, the Saints dominated the run of play. Siena freshman Megan Riccardi would net a goal with just 10 minutes remaining and with it went Quinnipiac's hopes of a postseason run as Siena went on to win. Two to nothing. And John, with that loss, the Bobcats were one win shy of making the playoffs. Siena slid in as the sixth seed and played number three, Ryder. Number four, Marist faced off against number five, Niagara, in the quarterfinals. Number one seed, Monmouth, and number two, Manhattan, received a bye. The semifinal matchups are set with Monmouth against Siena and Manhattan facing off against Ryder. The semifinals will be played on November 6th, and the MAC champion will be crowned on November 8th. Sticking on the women's side, the women's ice hockey team made history in Providence on Friday with a 2-0 win against Brown. The Bobcats allowed three shots on goal in the entire game, the fewest in team history. The previous record of 12 on the opposition shots was set at January at Union. 
Sophomore T.T. Sianferrano and freshman Melissa Samuskevich continued their hot streaks in the game. The two combined for three of the four Bobcat goals in the contest. The women's ice hockey team also took on rival Yale this week. Yale scored the only goal in the first period, but Quinnipiac would answer back on the back, on the back of Quinnipiac junior Emma Woods. Woods led the team in points with one goal and one assist. It was Woods' fourth multi-point game of the season. The third period was a shootout between the Bobcats and the Bulldogs. Yale took a 2-1 to one lead early in the third, but Quinnipiac would answer 55 seconds later. The Bobcats then took a 3-2 to two lead midway through the, the third period, but Yale fought back to tie the game and 35 seconds later won, won the game 4-3 to three on a Janelle Ferreira goal. Women's ice hockey dropped to 7th in this week's USCHO poll after defeating Brown and losing to Yale this past weekend. The Bobcats were ranked 5th heading into their first weekend of conference play. The strong showing against Brown was overshadowed by their upset loss to Yale, leading their drop back to 7th. Three other ECAC teams cracked the top 10, with Clarkson at 4, Harvard at 9, and Princeton at 10. The team travels to take on Colgate and Cornell next weekend. Also, the UCH USCHO men's hockey polls were released this week after a big weekend sweeping a two-game set from the former number nine team in the country, St. Cloud State, Quinnipiac had a, where Quinnipiac had a goal differential of nine goals to two in the two games. The Bobcats now find themselves at, num at the number five spot in the nation after being ranked ninth just a week ago. The Bobcats look forward to taking to the road to face Colgate on November 6th and will stay on the road to face Cornell on November 7th. Quinnipiac had three players win ECAC Weekly Awards for their play in this past weekend series. Travis St. Dennis was the player of the week after he had a pair of two goal games against St. Cloud State. The four goals were twice as many as any other ECAC player that weekend. The assistant captain is tied for the team lead in points with eight and also leads the team with six goals through six games so far this season. Michael Garteg was named ECAC Goalie of the Week after allowing just three goals in two games against former number nine St. Cloud State. Garteg made 41 saves in the second game of the two-game set, marking the senior's career high in saves. And freshman defenseman Chase Prisky took home Rookie of the Week after his first collegiate goal as well as two assists. In six games this season, he's had six points and a plus three rating. Coming up after the break, the women's rugby team sought vengeance against Army this week. And shine the hardwood because basketball is back. We have Maury Hirschgren in to talk men's basketball. Stick with us. Welcome to A Sheer Sensation, North Haven's premier cosmetology service, located at 140 Washington Avenue, minutes from Hamden. We offer an array of services from basic cuts and colors to lash extensions and formaldehyde free keratin treatments. We also provide hair chalk and styling for men. When you spend $60, your cue card will get you 10% off. Call us at 203-239-6477 to make your next appointment at a sheer sensation. My name is Doug Thoreau. For nearly 90 years, three generations of my family have been providing the highest quality repair service. Insurance companies will refer car owners to lesser quality shops to save money. At Thoreau Auto Body, we provide the highest quality repairs with a lifetime guarantee to maintain the safety and value of your car. That's the quality you deserve. Thoreau Auto Body, our best work goes unnoticed. Whether you want a new look or the perfect wedding day hair, come to us for the new hair and nail care. Gracious, relax with a variety of massage techniques, including Swedish and hot stone massage. Joyous spa and salon. Call today. Thanks for sticking with us. Last time the Quinnipiac women's rugby team took on Army, the team suffered a loss at the hands of a 22-point comeback. The Bobcats took an early lead as Emily Roscoff had two tries for the Bobcats as they ha had a lead going into the second half. 14-7, the Bobcats would pile it on and take a 24-7 lead with 30 minutes remaining. Army then scored 22 unanswered points to win 29-24. Let's kick it to the highlight. 
See how the Bobcats fared the second time around. First half. Army's Alyssa Peters McKeithen is going to make a great tackle here to help Army maintain ju just being down 10 to nothing to the Bobcats. Now with 18 minutes left in the first half, Maggie Miles to Ross Cup to hate for the goal for the try at the pylon. Quinnipiac takes a 15 to nothing lead. Now, early on here, coming up in the second half, Quinnipiac's Maggie Miles says, "All aboard and don't get on the tracks when the train is coming." She takes him down. Quinnipiac still leads the game, 15 to nothing. And now Alona Mar is going to take a stiff arm, runs right in the end zone for the try. Quinnipiac takes the lead, 20 to nothing. Four minutes later, Army is going to get a nice flurry of passes here and get the ball into the end zone, marking a 20 to seven lead for the Bobcats. And then Army would not finish there. They would try try to make the comeback, but it would not be enough as Quinnipiac went on to win the game, 20 to 12. Now let's take it to Becky Carlson after the game. And you know the fact of the matter is, is that this team came out here with a, a fire in their bellies because we lost to them the first time. And uh, I don't think it was a, a loss that we necessarily felt we deserved. Uh, but you know, ultimately they came together, and that last push. They're the United States Army. They should always have the last push. And we knew they wouldn't go quietly, and we were just plugging holes up the middle and hoping that they weren't passing it out to their wings as much as they did. And uh, that we, were, we got lucky at times. Uh, they were aggressive. They pushed us back on their heels. But uh, we prevailed because we scored more points than they did. I think just stick with it throughout the whole game. We started to, like, during the first time of the game, we started to falter a little bit, and then we let them get ahead. But even here, when they started to get ahead, we pushed back double what they did. So, um... And we never gave up. Even if they scored tries, we, we wanted to get back and we need to give them momentum. The men's basketball team finished sixth place in the conference last year with a 9-11 and 11 MAC record. We've got basketball analyst Maury Hirschgordon standing by. Maury, how are you? Gabby, I'm awesome. It's basketball season again. We're back in the studio. We're going to have some hot hoops this season. Our basketball beat reporter teams look good and they, they look ready to go. Now, Maury, let's start. What's the atmosphere in the locker room looking like this year? John, it's been pretty positive. Tom Moore said that, you know, it's the biggest turnover that he's ever had in one season. It starts at the top with athletic director uh, Greg Amodio, who takes over for Jack McDonald. Then it starts to trickle into the team. He has three new freshmen, Andrew and Aaron Robinson, as well as Abdullah Bundu. He has three transfers, Donovan Smith, Daniel Harris, and Will Simonton, as well as Giovanni McLean, the guy that everyone's been wanting to get to watch at this point. Everyone's seen him in practice. He was ineligible last year due to transcript issues from his junior college, but he's got a lot of game. Also, in the coaching staff, there's a new assistant coach, Tony Newsom. He played his, high, he played his college ball at Niagara. He coached at Ryder. He also coached at Fairfield. So he knows the Mac really, really well. And you have a new director of basketball operations, Mark Fogel, who is an assistant coach at a junior college down in Texas. So, you know, John, I'm looking at 11 players, and any, any of the 11 could really, you know, start between one and five. Tom Moore's got a lot of depth this season, a lot of energy in that locker room. Now, Maury, we've got a little bit of a change in the rules here in the offseason, taking the shot clock down from 35 seconds to 30. How does that affect Tom Moore's strategy? Well, Gabby, it's going to affect both ends of the court drastically. Tom Moore told me a few weeks ago that offensively he's going to look for new sets, whether it's screens along the baseline and the elbow to free up jump shooters like Dimitri Flores and James Ford Jr. He also said he might run two high ball screens instead of one high ball screen at the end of shot clocks with Aaron Hutton, a sophomore point guard who is a Mac All rookie team, as well as Giovanni McLean, the big playmaker and shot maker. With a double high ball screen up top, you, you can have the drive, uh, the drive option, you can have one big roll down to the bottom of the basket at the block, you can have one stay at the elbow, or you can dish to the wings out wide. They have a tall team, only two players below six feet three inches, so they got a lot of length, a lot of athleticism for the offensive side. And for the defensive side, Tom Moore is going to use that length and athleticism. He said he's going to trickle in a little more zone this year. Now, Maury, you've been around the team. Who seems to be emerging as a leader for this team this year? 
John, the obvious choice is, has to be James Ford Jr. He's the only fourth-year player here in Hamden. Like I said, a really young, a really inexperienced team with a lot of transfers. So he's a great guy on the court and off the court. He's a class act. And Johnny puts defense first. Whenever you have a player that puts defense first, you know his priorities are team first. Also, you know, Giovanni McLean will come into that leadership role on the court. He's got a lot of talent, was an Oklahoma commit. So definitely his play is going to speak on the court. And whether he, he starts to be a leader off the court, time will only tell. All right, now more to wrap it up. What are the expectations of this team this season? Uh, this, is the, this is the million dollar question, Gabby. You know, I'm still in the assessment stage right now. Uh, I look at one key stat, though. In the last five years, Tom Moore has had eight players average double-digit minutes. The fifth year, in 2009, in 2008 and 2009, his team finished second in the NEC. 22 wins, his second most wins in a single season here. A second place finish in the NEC, a semifinal, a, a semifinal appearance in the NEC playoffs. So with that formula, if Tom Moore can really get, play a lot of players in the game and, and use his depth and his athleticism and the, and the bench that's really going to pay dividends, then I definitely can see 16 to 19 wins in the regular season. Can he push 20? Yeah, I definitely think he can. All right. Well, thank you very much, Maury. Thanks, Gabby. Q30 Sports' own Hannah Cotter got a chance to sit down with men's basketball senior point guard James Ford, Jr. I'm here with senior basketball player James Ford, Jr. So there are seven new players on the team. How has the culture of the team changed? Uh, with the seven new players, we uh, we have a lot of so it's a lot of culture change. Uh, we have uh, some kids from uh, some more kids from Cameroon. So that's adding on to the previous kids we already have from Cameroon. Everybody else is like uh, from the state, so for the most part, it's still the same. So what's the atmosphere like in the locker room? Uh, <laughs> we have some characters on the team. A lot of great personalities. Kids are goofy. Um, the atmosphere in the locker room is very great. Uh, we all get along, we all love being around each other, and it's, 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 it's a great atmosphere to be around. So as a senior leader, what are you doing to help the new players adjust? Well, I'm do just basically telling them to keep their heads up, you know. Everybody makes mistakes, especially being a freshman coming into a new system, getting used to the college speed, the way the game is played, how everything works. Like, just basically like being that leader, that big brother to them when they need it, you know. So that's, that's basically what I'm trying to do. So obviously the expectations for the team are a lot different than last year. Mm -hmm. Last year in the MAC preseason rankings, you were ranked fifth, and this year you're ranked seventh. What are your own personal expectations? Um, similar to last year, you know, uh, prove, prove everybody wrong. Uh, rankings to me honestly don't mean nothing. You know, that's just basically other people's opinion. We know what we are capable of doing, so that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go out here, and most of all, we're going to come out victorious. That's what I hope. So what new strategies has Coach Moore been implementing during practice? In, in practice, uh, with us being a lot bigger and a lot more athletic, we run the ball a lot well, uh, a lot more screen and roll offense. Um, we got a lot of great shooters on the perimeter now, so therefore we have a guy by the name of Giovanni McLean who's able to get into the lane and distribute the ball very well to get everybody in the open areas and with likes of shooters like uh, Dan Harris, Dimitri Flores, myself, Aaron Hutton, Aaron Robinson, Andrew Robinson, everybody can shoot. So it's, 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 a great, it's great to be out there. Do you think that these improvements um, will help you guys considering you finished sixth last year? Most definitely, most definitely. Uh, these improvements will definitely uh, help us because last year as a team, we didn't really shoot the ball from the arc that well. Uh, maybe a couple guys individually may have shot the ball, but as a whole, a collective group, we didn't really shoot the ball that well. We was mainly an inside presence with the likes of Usman Drame and uh, you know, Zaid Hurst. So with them being gone, like we got to pick up the slack. Do you think that, again, the new faces will be able to fill in the missing void? Oh, for sure, for sure. With a collective effort. You know, uh, it's, it's hard to, you know, try to bounce back from an Usman Drame, a thousand points and thousand rebounds, and uh, Zaid Hurst, who's like a 1,400-point score. It's hard to do that, but from what, I've, from what I've been seeing in the new guys, we all can score the ball, so hopefully everybody collectively can make up that void, so it would be nice. Great. Is there anything that I missed or anything you'd like to add? Oh, no. Just watch out for us this year. It's going to be a nice, exciting year. Hopefully everybody come out show love. We're going to win a lot of games and have the crowd amp, so I'm excited. It's nice. Well, thank you very all much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. it. On the other side of the break, we have volleyball player Allison Lee live in studio for another segment of Meet the Bobcats. 
Also, we count down our top five plays of the week. Keep it locked. Sports Balls will be right back after this. Laser Medica Derma Centers is a new philosophy in skincare for all ages. We are dedicated to offering the most technologically advanced and least invasive skincare treatments. Show your cue card and receive 20% off any procedure. We also provide microdermabrasion and Botox treatments, all performed in a relaxing spa environment. We are conveniently located at 52 Washington Avenue in North Haven, just down the street from Quinnipiac's North Haven campus. Call to schedule a free consultation and find out how Laser Medica can give you smooth, sexy skin all year long. I could really go for a Ray and Mike sub right now. Come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken and cheese for just over four dollars. Giant cheesesteak subs and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as four seventy-five. Q cash accepted, just a mile down the road on Whitney. Here at Ray and Mike's. Welcome back to Sports Paws. Even though she's 4,000 miles from home, it hasn't stopped volleyball middle hitter Allison Lee from finding a new home on the court. Victoria Ritigliano sits down with her on this week's Meet the Bobcats. Thanks, guys. I'm Victoria Ritigliano here with Allison Lee. As I said, she's a junior on the volleyball team, comes from Alaska. So, Allison, what's the biggest difference for you from Hamden to Alaska? Uh, well, right now it's definitely the weather. It's snowing at home, um, so I'm enjoying the falls here. Um, and the other biggest difference is just the proximity um, of all the big cities. Um, the nearest city to where I live is basically Seattle, so it's a three-hour flight. Um, so I think that that's the biggest difference between the two places. Okay, so I read online that in <laughs> your hometown, Palmer, there is the Alaskan State Fair. Have you ever been to that? Yep, every year. What's that like? Um, so it's basically a fair, just a state fair that every other state has. Um, there's a lot of rides, a lot of food vendors. Uh, we always get our faces painted. Uh, it's probably my favorite time of the year. Okay. And where do you like living the most? Um, that's hard to say because Alaska will always be home. Um, but for now, I, I like being here in Hamden. Um, the East Coast has been really fun but I'll probably end up living back in Alaska or in Colorado okay. after school. So in a newspaper called The Frontiersman, which is a local newspaper mm -hmm. for, from your town, it said that you always wanted to go to school on the East Coast. Why was that? Um, because, honestly, because I would never live here permanently, and so I wanted to go somewhere for school that's different and new, and what better time to do that than college. And then, how often do you get to talk to your family, considering there's a four-hour time difference between here and there? Um, we probably talk, I call my mom probably every other day. Um, it's a little annoying sometimes when I wake up and I need something really bad, and it's you know, 10 o'clock here and 6 a.m. there. Um, but we work around it. And do they ever get to watch your games? Yeah, um, my, both my parents follow the live stats, and they'll watch the game when it's, um, when it's streaming live. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. Back to you guys at the desk. Well, home court, would, home court advantage would not make a difference as the women's volleyball team hosted three straight MAC matches at Burkhan Court. The Bobcats dropped the first match against Siena three sets to none on Wednesday. The team stumbled again, losing three sets to one on Saturday. They lost to Canisius on Sunday, also by a score of three sets to one. The following, following the tough home stretch, the Bobcats are now 23 and 23 on the year. The women's golf team had another strong outing at the St. John's Invitational last Monday and Tuesday. The team took first overall in the opening rounds with three golfers in the top five, including a second place finish from Luciana Tobia. The team tied for third overall in closing rounds with three golfers in the top ten. This Invitational was the last event for women's golf in the fall season. The men's soccer team took, took on Siena this week. The Saints traveled here to Hamden to take on the struggling Bobcats. 
Siena took an early 1-0 lead 18 minutes in on a header in traffic from a rebound by Chip Sherman. The Saints took the 1-0 lead into the half. The second half was quiet for both sides until Quinnipiac freshman Matt Taylor netted a goal with 20 minutes left to tie the game. Siena's junior, Siena's junior Rosario had the final answer with a goal just seven minutes remaining to give Siena a 2-1 lead that they would not relinquish. And John, men's soccer ended the MAC regular season with a 2-0 loss at Ryder, ending conference play with the 1-5-4 record. The team will travel to the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex in Fort, Florida, where they have the opening round of the MAC playoffs against Canisius. All right, Gabby, let's do it. Top five plays of the week. I'll take the odds, you take the evens. Absolutely, John. All right, let's kick it. Top five plays of the week, brought to you by Quinnipiac's own. Number five, we got field hockey. Angie King is going to lace a shot from way outside and tickle the twine for a goal. Quinnipiac will win the game 5-4. to four. Number four, rugby versus Army on Saturday. Maggie Miles driving on in. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Absolutely trucks an Army player. Number three, Quinnipiac goalkeeper Megan Conaboy slides and makes a stop with the pillows. Quinnipiac wins the game 5-4. Number two on the rugby pitch again, Alona Marr with a beautiful try. Bobcats ultimately win that game against Army 20 to 12. And now your number one play of the week. Quinnipiac sophomore Dana Barlow is going to dangle through a defender and she's going to net the game winner, slot it bottom corner for the win. Quinnipiac wins in overtime. Well, Gabby, another episode of Sports Pause has come to an end. It's too bad, John. Be sure to stay up to date with us on Twitter at Q30Sports and on our website, Q30Television.com. That's right, Gabby. For all of us here at Q30Sports, I'm John Franklin. That's Gabby Riggi. Stay beautiful, Bobcat Nation.